<clears throat> so we're going to start this particular little session in the roundhouse of a primitive Indian tribe, which is an issuing an order and an invitation that a young man who has been born into that tribe has been brought into the council in order that he may learn the facts of life. And uh, while this is quite a ways back, long before television, it has a great deal of depth to it that has more or less disappeared from our way of life. So we will go into this little round teepee tent where the men and women of the tribe are in a circle, where the medicine chief is about to speak, and a young lad stands in the presence of his elders. And the medicine priest explains to the young man the mystery of life. He says to him, you have been brought here by the will of the Great Spirit. You may have been here many times, but you have forgotten. But now you are here to learn more. And the more you learn, the less you will forget. You are here now to understand the purpose of your own existence. You have been sent here to learn. This is part of a great ritual, the ritual of growth, the ritual of unfolding the inward potential of the human being. You are a young man of the tribe. You have been born of one of our women. You have been nursed through your infancy and your childhood. You have been accepted by us, cared for us, and loved for us. Now you are going to have a second birth. You are going to be born out of our love into your own self-respect, into your own maturity, into the world that you belong to or you wouldn't have come here. So here is the story as the way it is. Once upon a time, you were a spirit in the strange and mysterious lands of the Great One. You walked with the immortals and the eternals, and you were one with them. And the master of all mysteries said to you, you shall go forth. It is your destiny to grow, to unfold, and to mature from childhood into the fullness of your years. And it is your destiny to do this according to our laws, according to our will and the keeping of our commandments. Therefore, we have sent you down into the body of this good woman who is to bring you forth as her firstborn. Now you will listen to the wisdom of the tribe, what it has to say. It says that one somewhere not here, you went to sleep. And you went to sleep maybe many times. But when you woke from that sleep, you were an infant in the keepings of this mother. And she is the one who brings you into the tribe. She is the one who makes you part of a great growing society. She is the one who must help you to learn the ways of wisdom. So when she brings you forth, she brings you forth into a second womb, a second birth in time. And that second birth is this tent where we are now, where we as the elders are gathered, where we are now to instruct you in the ways of the old and the greats and the truths as it has been given unto us. For we are all one family. You are the child of all of us. Therefore, we are all parents. We are all friends. We are all relations of yours. There is no stranger in this tent. Therefore, now you will listen. And we will tell you, there is a law, a very ancient law, that says that there was a ladder. And this ladder was made of life. And in this, on this ladder all kinds of living things were. There were birds, there were serpents, there were beasts of the field and butterflies of the air, fish of the sea. They were all on this ladder. And all forms grew up on this ladder, step by step, rung by rung, until finally they came to the dawn of their humanity. And in this humanity, they fulfilled the pleasure, the will, and the wisdom of the Great Spirit. So now, we are about to bring you into another birth, 
the birth into the tribe, the birth into human society. And this is a problem and it is a labor which you must consider. As you are nine months preparing to come into this world, you are 21 years learning to live here. And when you have ten finished those 21 years, you will be a mature human being. And we will no longer care for you, but you will join with us to care to other children who will be coming after you. This is one family. It is called the human family. And there's nothing in it but brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers, sons and daughters. There are no strangers in this family. So now as your new teachers, as those who take on after you are born, we tell you the way of life. We tell you what the Great Spirit tells us and he, we trust him always. First of all, you must keep open the road, the road between here and the great sachems in the house in the sky. You must never do anything that closes your contact with the great source of good. You must never betray it. You must never transgress it. You must never ignore it. Because at all times from here on, your great strength comes from the fact that you are always able to reach out and touch reality. This is the thing you must learn. The next thing you must learn is that you are not here simply to grow. You are here to grow, to live, to help, to teach, and to contribute to the growth of all other living things. For all the other little creatures in this world are your younger brothers and sisters, and you must take care of them to the best of your ability. Now there are things you cannot do that we know, but there are many things you can do, and some of these you must do. So now we bring to the point where you are no longer a child. You are no longer simply tied by an umbilical cord to your mother, but you are tied by an umbilical cord to this house and all who dwell in it, because they are part of your family, part of yourself, and you would not be here were it not for them. You are not only the child of your mother, but the child of her mother, and her mother's mother, and all the fathers who have gone before, for there is only one family. And that family is the brotherhood of all that lives. Now you must learn this. You must never forget it. Because if you forget it, or you go against it, you destroy your own life. You compromise your own principles, and you bring heart aches and pains and miseries and misfortunes to the family that loves you. You must therefore always be true. Now what is the truth that you must always follow if you are to succeed? The first truth of all is courage. The courage to dare to be right. The courage to support that which you know to be right, rather than to compromise in the favor of something easier for yourself. Before your success, before your fulfillment, before your continuance even in life, there must be honor. There must be a dedication. You must do nothing in the midst of the night or in the darkness of misery that is against the will of the Great Spirit. The Great Spirit's will is supreme. And after you have come down to the understanding that there must be no compromise between good and evil, then you may say, what is evil? Evil is compromise. It is the individual trying to be greater than the Great Spirit. And when he disobeys the Great Spirit, he cuts the thread between himself and the eternal life. Now it is also true that you must have your own inner spiritual contact with truth. As the medicine priest of this tribe, I carry the gate and I open the door into the mysteries of the great medicine lodge in the sky, where the sachems and the great ones dwell in constant and eternal meditation contemplating upon the mysteries of the world. So we now have to know how to reach these people. So I will tell you. You reach them by quietude, by absolute silence, by a mysterious waiting in which your heart and your soul wait to hear the voice of the truths and the old ones and the, those who are your great teachers. And as you sit quietly, you will do vigil. You will go out under the sun, under the moon, and under the stars, even under the storm clouds. And there you will put up the four uh, flags of prayer, the prayer sticks with the little feathers on the end. 
and you will make a hollow square of the four standing sticks and then you will kneel and sit in meditation in the midst of the sticks and you will say Father show me the way and the silence will come and in the night there will be all kinds of voices of birds and of animals there will be things to frighten you some to worry you and there will also be a drowsiness which may cause you to go to sleep but you must try to stay awake as much as you can but you are only a young boy therefore you may not be perfect but you must try and in the course of this very vigil something will appear to you this something is probably an animal or a bird and this creature will come to you and will say I am your brother therefore I am your companion I am the one who walks with you throughout this life I am an alter ego here to help you and protect you I cannot live your life I cannot interfere with it because I am not a human being therefore I can only be there like a faithful servant or a faithful brother but I will be there always as long as you live to help you and in trouble in tra tragedy and in, in worry and fear and sickness you may pray to me and I will hear your words now if in this darkness and misery and mystery of the great silence of the vigil there shall appear the thunderbird the great bird of glory in the sky with wings of bronze and feathers of gold this great creature will come and if this creature comes and stands before you in all its splendor then you are to be a priest you are then dedicated to the service of the great Lord in the sky and that thunderbird will be with you throughout life and the thunderbird or your sachem whichever it may be will give you also your death song for before an Indian dies he must sing the song that tells that he accepts all things without question and without doubt and he offers up his life to the will of the great spirit so before you die even though there is a bullet in your heart or an arrow in your body you must stay alive long enough to sing your song the song of victory the song of the victory of a clean life over all the adversities and miseries of existence and you will go forth and return to the great lodge in the sky from which you came and you will see the sachem sitting by the great campfires which we call the stars and then you will know that you have fulfilled your work in the meantime you will be here and maybe you will have a long life many years but the next thing you must do is to prepare to be one of the living fathers of your house each of us must go our way and return to the masters who sent us therefore one of these days you will be the one who has to lead the people there is nothing you should think of nothing you should dream of nothing you should believe except how to lead your people that in all things the wisdom will come to you but it can only come to you if you are without ulterior motive of any kind you must be perfectly honest or else you will receive false guidance because the guidance will come from yourself rather than from the great spirit but if you remain clear and clean you will also have the wisdom of the spirit you will find that the great spirit will talk to you in an emergency will tell you the way to help to heal the sick or help to comfort the dying and how to win against the terrors and sorrows of mortal existence and you will become a teacher of our people and you will realize that everyone who comes into the world of any race of any kind each one is a potential teacher of his people for each by example must lead the way each by service must prove the dedication each by sacrifice must fulfill the purpose of his own existence to this there is no escape and those who try to escape will in only find a great silence a great darkness coming over them in the meantime there are things you to learn we will entrust to you the wisdom of our people we will tell you the secrets of the healings we will tell you where the buffalo are we will tell you when the storms come we will give all the knowledge that we can and we will tell you when other little ones are going to come into the world said to be with you and to become your children regardless of who their physical parents are because in the tribe there is only one family all the family is bound together 
by a great secret mystical tie. Well, they are all children of the one great spirit that dwells in the sky. And having done all these things, you will then learn the ways of life. You will learn the useful arts. You will learn how to help people who are in trouble. You will learn how to forget yourself in the service of others. You will, you will learn how to be sick yourself, but how sick will serve the dying. All these things are part of the great mystery. And this great mystery is that we are here for one purpose and one purpose only, to grow. And the only way we can grow is to forget ourselves in serving others. There is no other way to grow. There is no such a thing as selfish growth. There is no such a thing as self-centered growth. There is only growing by sacrificing self to the eternal purposes of life. For you are all servants of the great spirit. And wherever the spirit leads, you must follow. Whatever the spirit demands, you must give. And there must be no doubt or question in your life to become a teacher of your people, a faithful priest of the great mysteries of the Thunderbirds. You must realize that you have now at this time dedicated your life out of your own keeping, out of your own control, out of your own being, and dedicated it completely to the will of the eternal. In having the will of the eternal, you will have no more suffering. There will be no more pain. For anything that the will of the Great One demands, that is beautiful and that is good. So now you have to come into the world and now you have to create a new birth. And in the teen years between the birth and adulthood, you must become again a new little child growing up until in your majority you are born again into your people as a citizen. You are born as part of us. Now you are an apprentice. You are a seeker. You are one we are helping, controlling, directing, inspiring, instructing. But when that 21st birthday comes, or its equivalent, you will no longer be a child. You will be a grown person. And the moment you are a grown person, you are responsible for your own destiny. You are responsible for the truth that you live. You are responsible for the offers and orders that you keep. You are responsible not only for your own future, but to help in the futures of all who come in contact with you. So now the time comes for you to be initiated into the maturity of the tribe in order that you may re reflect and, and manifest all the good things that the tribe itself has to teach. Now as a member of the tribe you also have another problem. A woman brought you into life and gave you this body. It is now your turn to become a parent. You must, in order to be true to the great spirit, you must have a son or a daughter that will go on after you. Because as you are indebted for your own birth, so you have to pay for this by bringing another in and to conferring upon that other all the good that you know, all the wisdom that you know. You must never turn from your own child to the per perfection of your own luxuries or the fulfillment of your own ambitions. From the moment you become a parent, you take on the duties which the Great Spirit takes on for you. As the Great Spirit guides you in all things, so the Father guides his child in all things. All this goes on one after generation because there is no other way. And after the time has come and the new child is born and grows up, then the mystery is repeated. He must also go out and sit in the silence, must do vigil, and must receive his ordination. Everyone who goes out into life must have an ordination, must have something. Now we say in this modern world these things don't apply anymore. They may not apply outwardly, but they do apply inwardly. For there is an outer code that caters to the physical life of things but an inner code that is never satisfied except by the redemption of the spirit and the release of the soul. These things, therefore, there are two law laws. The laws of the material world, and on your 21st birthday, you declare yourself to be above them. And the laws of this world of soul and of spirit into which you are now born. Mistakes you made as a child will be forgiven, but these same mistakes are not forgiven after you have reached the age of knowing and understanding. 
And you must also protect this body that you have. You must never pollute it. You must never defile it. You must never abuse it. Because it is an instrument by means of which you have the power to help, the power to serve, the power to give, and the power to be enlightened. For this body is a precious thing that has been conferred upon you. If you pervert it, you destroy it, or pollute it, there is some great pain. There is no way in which you can break the rules without pain. The only way to have no pain is to keep the rules. And if you're keeping the rules, you still go through pain. It is the pain of understanding, the pain of relief, of the realization that this pain is necessary to the perfection of your own nature. Now, it is the young Indian is sitting or standing in this group, receives the benediction, receives the symbols of the membership in his tribe, and receives the truths of his own ordination. And every child that is born into the world is born an ordained priest of the mystery of life. And unless he prefers to go into material things and sacrifice his natural destiny, he will continue throughout life to serve life, to give all to life, and to give it all not in his own name or for his own fulfillment, but in the name of the spirit that then dwells within him, and that he may be found worthy by the great lodge of the sachems, the lodge that sits in the sky. Now the young trip boy may be a little doubtful of some of these things. So the master of the mysteries, the old priest who is someday going to give way to him, says, come with me then and I will show you. So they sit down quietly in meditation in the midst of the prayer flumes. And all of a sudden the young boy finds that he is outside of his own body. He is no longer in his body. And he looks and the old Indian is standing beside him and he is also out of his body. And he says to the child, come with me to the lodge of the great ones. So they go down a wonderful winding path and up the side of a very steep mesa into desert country. And there is a peak. And when they reach the top of the peak, there is the great lodge, the medicine lodge of the great tribes of mankind. And in this lodge, there is every nation, every race, every belief, everything that is good is there. But nothing that is not good can enter in. So the young boy goes in with the master of the lodge and sees for himself the great ones who have gone before. The Indian has no book to read. He has no written record that he can tell. He has only the stories that come to him from the wise ones. And these wise ones' stories come down to the dawn of time. And there he sees for himself the great lodge of the sky the immutable, inevitable victory of right over everything else, regardless of whether it is obvious or not. Here is perfect justice, but it is justice with mercy. In the lodge of the sky there is no damnation. There is no heretic. There is nothing except eternal solicitude, a great determination on the part of the great lodge to bring forth into perfection the smallest and least of all living creatures. And having been given the vision, the young man returns to the world dedicated and, de and de de devoted to the fulfillment of the destiny of the tribe. Now that is the way it was understood in the old days. And that is not just a story of an Indian tribe. Because the Indian tribe is here on our own continent, the North American, Central American, South American tribes, all with the same essential teaching but it is also the teaching of all the other religions of the world. The religions that teach that in a mysterious way there is a reason for us. There is no such a thing as an accident. Sometimes it may seem that in the generation of living things there are many accidents and many miscarriages of justice. But all this is an illusion. Behind everything that happens is the will of the Great Spirit. And the will of the Great Spirit has only one thing to learn, to teach that those who are taught may live to teach others in their turn. And so with this type of thought, we can come down maybe for a little bit to the modern way of life. How are our dedications? How are our convictions about these matters? 
Do we recognize every child that comes into the world as a citizen of eternity? Do we recognize them all as brothers and sisters? Do we recognize a common responsibility that we have for all that lives? Because in turn, all that lives has to accept the responsibility of our existence. As we have been given, so shall we give. As we have been helped, so shall we help. And if there are things that are not right, and the parents or the children or anyone involved, then then we must go into the lodge and very carefully spread the white uh, robes of the peace on the floor and call upon the spirits to relieve us of our anxieties. Every mother and father has a a duty. Every parent, grandparent, all relatives, even friends. A friend is just a little more distant relative. But the same thing is true. Until the world realizes that humanity is one family, there will never be an end to pain. And that was realized long before there were books. And it's been forgotten ever since there were great mediums for the transmission of knowledge. There has been no realization of the great purpose behind all of this. The great purpose that we are gradually being created into a race of heroes, a race of great spirits who can go forth to carry the wisdom of the ages beyond the stars, beyond the planets, not with mechanical ships built out of steel and muted by various chemicals, but the the great spirit of life itself, the spirits that come into birth, the spirits that come in to learn, and which must go forth in time to become the teachers of all that live. And each one comes with a lesson to learn and a gift to make. And those who are coming up now to their maturity, we may like to think of that a kind of a maturity of the world is coming with a sort of 21st birthday. And we think maybe that birthday is the beginning of a new century. That a new century is coming in which we will have something that is better. But when the time comes to celebrate the coming of this birthday, we can't do it with ice cream and cake. We've got to do it with dedication. We've got to do it by making a real purpose out of our own existence. I may be thinking a little bit about the old medicine priest who was never was able to write a word, who never spoke to anyone but a member of his own tribe, but became a tremendous power because he was a power of dedication, a power of giving to these young people the key to the reason for themselves. And until we give to young people the reason for themselves, we will still have juvenile delinquency. But if we once give them the reason for themselves, if we can once convince them that there is this great message and that we are all born to teach, we are all born to teach and born to learn, and from the learning we teach and from the teaching we learn. These are the lessons of life, and that is the reason why uh, education is is nothing if it is not accompanied by dedication, by some tremendous internal experience. Uh, There must be an inward uh, motion towards reality. Now we look at the young people of today who are not in any Indian tent or on the side of an old hill. Most of them do not even respect education because it isn't educating them. They don't expect education because they have none. They do not see any reason why they should be better because nobody else is. All of this tremendous uh, verbal, written understanding from books. The professor gives a lesson from page 212. The child memorizes the page and gets the correct page and correct line and gets a passing mark. He knows nothing. He learns nothing. And the professor can do no better. Because if he does any better, the relatives of the pupils will come down on him uh, claiming that he is interfering with the blessed privilege of raising their children the way they want to. So we don't have much. But somewhere along the way, we must go back far enough to reach the future. We've got to go back to the point where we can find where the threads have separated and where we have lost more than we have ever been able to gain. Every child that comes into this world should realize that they have a magnificent opportunity to help themselves and all other living things to grow. That they must keep their bodies clean 
in order that they in turn may be the gates to new generations yet unborn. But they must keep their minds healthy because healthy minds do not get into crime or degeneracy. They have got to recognize that each person who comes into this world comes with a duty to be a good citizen of humanity, to give a proper help to all in need. If education is vitalized, if we are really given purposes and realizations, we will realize that education is without much merit to anyone concerned unless an educated person is more useful than an uneducated one. Now usefulness is not necessarily uh, in lines of academic uh, ex uh, examples. A useful person is one who basically loves his fellow man, basically wants to be a help, wants to be of use, wants to help to make a better world, wants to go against the forces of corruption. A good young person growing up is growing up to become a servant of his people, just as the Indian boy grows up to be a servant of his people. The Indian boy has only made 20 people that he must help and must take care of. Some of us growing up in this world now must maybe have a million people as our protégés. They all need something we have to give them. It is not that we should go on as young people. It is that we should recognize that as young people we will help to redeem our own ancestors, that we will help to redeem our parents, and that we will help to redeem the generations that come after us. That the young people are the carriers of the great message. They are the carriers of the great progress. If we train our young people to be just like ourselves, we are destroying the reason for evolution. We must train young people to know more than we do, to have more courage than we have, to have more dedication than we have ever known, because they see a little deeper into the future than we do. And how do they get the seed in the more into the future? They see the Indian way. The Indian way to see into the future is to be still and know, to recognize that the truth we seek come not to us, but through us, that they are part of our own internal life, that they are dedications which we are all privileged to share, and that in this case they are the beginnings of the regeneration of humanity. We can never save the world unless the young people come to know their marvelous gift and the great good that they can do. And they should have something of this in their education. The young child growing up should not be simply educated to get a job because most of the jobs he gets are also very ephemeral. The great spirit in the sea, lodge in the sky, gives jobs but takes them away again in a few years. Gives us new inventions and then wears them out. Gives us new opportunities and then when we spoil them, pick up the opportunities and put them back in the basket against a better generation so that all these things are according to rules, rules that were never written, but rules that are in the hearts of every living thing and have been at the basis of every religion the world has ever had, is the realization that we are all here to be useful, that we are here to help the great plan. We are to become the children and guides and uh, successors to the great spirits. Somewhere along the way, the great spirit of the earth will go home. We do not know what it means when it goes home, but it will graduate. It will no longer be the spirit of this world. It will go on to something else, the next step in the great ladder of evolution. But when it departs, it will leave behind it its children, those he, that have t accepted its way, who have accepted its laws, and who are going to carry on and do the work that this other one is no longer to do, but has other work assigned so that everyone works for some good to help things to get better. And all this bustle and bustle that goes on here now about who has more of what or less of something else, or who is going to make the biggest machine, or who is going to travel the most rapidly, all these things are of no value whatever. There is nothing in this material world that is satisfactory to itself. There is nothing that happens here which is by its happening here is important. 
The only thing that is important about the things that happen here is that to the thoughtful person, they give a key to something deeper that is happening inside themselves. It is not that this world is going to be a success, but that the individual is going to find out the real truth about this world, what it is and what it, why it is, and that it is merely a stepping stone on the road to eternity. There is nothing permanent here. There's nothing unchanging but change. There is nothing we can expect from this world except a peaceful adjustment to realities and a dedication to do everything in our power, everything within our means to make this a better world. This was the way of the American Indian. And it seems to me that we have no better heritage in this Western Hemisphere than the heritage we gained from them. And they are slowly fading away. And little by little the Indian is forgetting he's an Indian. And it's too bad. Because then the great spirit will probably bring him home. If he can no longer live his way, he will sing his death song and depart. Because he will either live that way, or he will wait, and in the society that we have, some woman will bear him, and he will be part of our way of life, and suffer we as we have suffered, and fail as we are failing. There is no success except in the keeping of the rules of the Great Spirit. And these rules are the basis of our happiness as persons, the success of our families, the realization of all things that we desire and we want to have happen. Now we can all start somewhere. Most of us can't start back at the beginning of our lives because that part has been lived. But there is something we can always do, and that is that we can pick up every day something that needs this insight. We can see something that would be better if we did it better. Something that would be more useful to all concerned if we were less selfish. Something that would last a little longer in this world of shadows if we didn't terminate it by our own self-centeredness and egotism. Therefore, everyone in his own place can start now to have his place in the plan of things. He can have his own little prayer flags standing in the night while in meditation he dreams the dream of human brotherhood. These are the points that the Indian still thinks about because there is nothing that can possibly be more important to the human being than to discover that he is a brother or sister with all that lives. That there is no longer such a thing as loneliness. There is no such a thing as isolation. There is no such a thing as frustration. No such a thing as failure. All is success. All we have to do is to recognize that we are of one family, of one friendship, of one destiny, and of one dedication. These things coming will be of great value in this new way that is to come. Now also we have to realize that we face all kinds of educational changes and that these are going to affect us in the next few years. But these are not going to be a, a terrible emergency. There is no reason why we should worry if our educational system falls apart. It was never any good anyway. <laughs> it was a failure from the beginning because it did not remember or did not know the will of the Great Spirit. And if it did know, it forgot. And in some of the old faith, they did know, but they have forgotten. And the faith themselves have been forgotten. Therefore, the way we are doing it now doesn't deserve to live. It has no permanent value. It only helps us to make a little more money before we die, and then a little more tough trouble for our heirs after we are gone. There is nothing here that is of value except that thing which is locked within us, the soul. The real spirit of our lives we come out of this world enriched only by the revelation that we have had of our own internal destiny. The individual who out of this life learns to outgrow this life, he is wise. The person who out of this life suddenly realizes that hatred destroys itself, that selfishness ends in chaos, that war ends in confusion. All of these things are the mistakes, and our present world with its present conditions is simply a monument to mistakes. 
mistakes on every level, on politics, on industry, in science, everything. Everything is mistake. Why? Because of lack of dedication. Nothing can succeed that is not dedicated to the good of all that lives. The moment selfishness comes in, disaster follows. If there is a sp spirit of evil anywhere in the world, it is selfishness. And it is selfishness that makes us betray the purpose for our own destiny. And it's now, since the beginning of the Christian era, we've had 2,000 years of betrayals. We've had every good, every beauty, every truth fought against, destroyed, now compromised in the name of profit. And out of all this profit, what do we have? The most we can possibly hope for is a larger monument in the cemetery. And, of course, to leave behind us our worldly goods, to, which in turn will make sinners out of our own children. We don't have much. It's all something that is a strange kind of dream, a nightmare. We're in that nightmare now. We are not in it every day. Every morning we get the newspaper, more nightmare, more confusion, more misery is brought to our attention. And we, claiming to be intelligent, claiming to be educated, claiming to have vision and understanding, remain terror-stricken in the midst of our own mistakes. There seems to be no answer to this, but there is an answer. We've got to stop making the mistakes. There is no other way. There will never be any way that we can prop up a disaster. Ultimately, it will happen. Ultimately, it will bring us back to the realization of the old Indian medicine priest that everything that succeeds, succeeds with the blessing of the Great Spirit. And nothing that has this blessing withheld can ever succeed. So there, this Great Spirit becomes a kind of personification of the laws of the universe, the laws of the great Manado who rules all things. And if we keep these rules, we live. If we break these rules, we die. But in death, it is not as serious as we think. Death will be a terrible tragedy, only to people who have too much in this world to think about and to leave behind. If an individual must leave a fortune, his, his passing may be rather painful. But if he knows from the beginning it was never his, he can leave it in peace and go on to something better. It is very well to remember, like the Indian, that the miseries that we call success today are on their way out. But what is coming is better. And instead of a success uh, mixed in with massive pain, misery, fear, we can have a quiet success, fulfilling the way of life that was intended for us. We can live in peace and pass on in peace, and the horrors of transition will be no more. So we can take from the people of our own continent, those who were here before we were, and who are now going slowly home to the great Manado. He is calling his people back into the life that is gone. He is calling them away from this problem into something else. But in the meantime, he has left behind a strange and curious legend, a legend that love wins all wars. But in the end, there cannot be any hatreds without destruction and any selfishness without pain and any ambition that becomes too strong so that it destroys the peace and security of other people. Now, when we get down to our own little problems here, what are we going to do about this? Here we have a matter of education coming up. We know definitely that we are on the wrong track. We are on the track of assuming that education is competitive. We are assuming that there are three levels of intelligence. A low level in which we are educated for crafts and trades. A middle level in which we are the blue collars, uh, destined and foreordained to reasonable comforts. And there is that upper class, very small but very powerful, which was intended by God to control and win and rule the world. All of this is trivia. There's nothing whatsoever. The great truth rests in the internal integrities. The poor man who is honest 
is far much further along in the patterns of evolution than the rich man who is not honest. Those who have lived the best they know have something to look to fall back upon, something that does not bring pain, something that does not come with angry dreams at the end of life. We all have to finally make peace with integrities. Now, how do we know how to make this kind of peace? Perhaps we don't know these integrities very well. Well, it's not as difficult as you might think at first try, because these integrities represent of soul and the victory of soul power over ordinary mentality. <clears throat> now in connection with our education, how do we apply soul powers? Do we give up reading and writing? No. The only thing is we use reading and writing to help to grow. Do we have to give up dreams and ideals and hopes? No. We just need to put the strength behind what is right so that it wins. Do we mean that we have to live and die poor? No. But we have to live and die in harmony with our own conscience. And if we decide in our conscience that our worldly goods are not honestly gained, then we must give them up. All of these things constitute the final step of the individual's coming of age. We say now, as the Egyptians said and many other people, that there is an age, approximately 21 years, that is the maturity of the human being physically. It is at this time that he is born out of the womb of the family, out of the womb of childhood, into this chilly air of self-discretion discretion and determination. We know that at that time, around 21 years, there is a new birth in each person, in which he passes from the protection of the family to the full maturity of his own destiny. There should be some kind of a definite statement of what this means, that the individual having reached maturity is no longer to lean upon something else, but is to permit the weaker to lean upon him. Maturity represents the taking over of life with its integrities, <clears throat> with its proper responsibilities, that the individual who has been taken care of through childhood comes to his own burden and must take care of his own children that the responsibilities come first, that the lavishness and the, and the joys and the sorrows are second to the burdens of fact, that the realities must be met, that each individual must pay the price that has been paid to give him the right to be an individual. The sacrifices that others have made for him, he must be prepared to pay for. It is not possible to go on through life perpetuating one selfish generation after another. One by one, the selfish generations die of their own selfishness. And if there is nothing to succeed them, the nations die, races die, and planets may die. Because everything to live must be part of a chain of life that has no beginning and no end. The great chain of life, the great chain of destiny, goes on and on. And if it is broken, that which breaks it dies. For everything is here to improve. And anyone who impairs improvement destroys themselves. Anyone who tries to force his own will upon others unreasonably perishes for his audacity. And even the parent has a responsibility to the child. For the Bible says that we should not tempt our children to reproof and, dis and disloyalty. We should be able to help all things, for everything that exists is seeking its own maturity, seeking the fullness of its own existence. It is here in order that it may complete the reason for being here. And we should all help that in every way that we can, and do all that we can do to make it easier. Now, we might have to sacrifice things to do it. Supposing it is a parent with small children, we should be forced to cut down the television time. Oh, that's a horrible possibility. <laughs> the destiny of it all, that we will lose the next last ball game, or that we won't be able to check in the next episode of an eternal and in inevitable sequence of events. All of this is foolishness. All of this is simply because we are lazy-minded. 
or else because we have no thoughts that are worth thinking. So we must borrow our thinking from the worst possible source, somebody else's thoughts. <laughs> so we go on, trying to be happy, trying to do the little stupid things that will give us comfort and peace, trying to relax away from our burdens, trying to get away from facts. And if anyone can get far from facts in the average television performance, they're miraculous workers now, right? Because most of this material is more visible than anyone could have happen to them in daily life, life in reality. <clears throat> so we have to begin to think in terms of investing in the things we believe in. We must invest in the children and we won't have so many juvenile delinquents. We must invest in helping young people to fulfill themselves instead of casting them aside into the terrible trench of, econ of economy which would grind them to pieces. We have to make sure that the gentle, the kindly, the sweet, the good has its own proper opportunity. That these things are real and that these are the things which must ultimately succeed. And it is better to fail now than to succeed in something that must ultimately fail entirely, to slightly paraphrase Woodrow Wilson. The definite problem is, therefore, in the 21st century, we should have something to send over there into the future. Young people with soul, young people with dedication, and also a simple plan, perhaps almost as simple as that of the old Indians. Just a rule that the thing, we must be kind, we must be true, we must be generous, and we must do all things for the common good, and do unto others as we would have them do unto us. If this factor could be strengthened, we would find that civilization would rise supreme over its own iniquities, and its various policies would pass away like clouds upon a summer sky. So the Indian, I remember one of them, I remember very well. He was an older man, he was not going to have any. Uh, descendant probably there was no one but he just stood, stood there with his blanket up around his neck and his black hair hanging on his shoulders and he just stood looking to the west and just standing there and we knew that inside himself he was singing his death song it wasn't going to be that day he wasn't like one of those that had a, 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 a cavalry bullet in his heart but he knew he was going home and that when he went home he was taking with him the last of the will of his people and he never found anyone much that he could pass this wisdom on to no one really cared these people thought he was just a crazy old savage but he had his own way but he could do something that most people can't do he could face the great spirit and say I've kept the rules so if we keep the rules, the rules will keep us. If we do that which is right and what is necessary, we can make this change over into the future as a beautiful spiritual adventure. And we need it badly. And today in the papers there are new statements. There are new struggles between nations. And after thousands of years of human effort, we come now in the 20th century into an impasse. We come to an impasse because if we go any further, we will interfere with the divine plan. And that we will not do. Unless we change our ways, the plan will have to change us. And this is going to be very hard and very difficult. And rather than hold out to the last bloody moment and try to be as selfish as we can to the deadline, we join with the progresses of change. If we become part of a better way of life, we will find that it is much nicer for us. And also, that we will be in much less worry. There are many beautiful things to do. There are many lovely jobs that need the doing. There are a number of lonely people who need help. We should do all we can to make this a better world to live in, rather than a world to talk about. We are going to have bankers and we're going to have politicians and we're going to have all these people for a little while because they are all gradually fading out because of their lack of usefulness. But in the meantime, we can have a much better world by simply paying no attention to those who are not right 
but working closely and dedicatedly with those who are right, trying to help them, trying to stand for the principles that we believe in. And whenever we are tempted to be selfish, stand strong like the old priest, medicine priest, and refuse to compromise the will of the Great Spirit. Also, this Christmas of the Great Spirit comes to us in one other way, and that is the concept of deity. Each nation of the world has a slightly different concept of the divine power of the source of life. Most of the belief of God as a, an omniscient and omnipresent power. Many think of deity as a parent. Many think of the deity as a principle. But they're all different interpretations of what deity is. But all agree on one thing, and that is what deity does. And deity keeps the rules. That which makes the rules is in itself the very rules themselves. And the, the great teachers of things have come to the conclusion that the Ten Commandments are about as good as anything we need, but we don't keep them. And that a nation should have no thought of these or the Beatitudes or the Sermon on the Mount, that these things are with us always in printed and written form and we do not obey them, then something is wrong with us. Not long ago, a Catholic group was engaged to make a new translation of the Sermon on the Mount. And after a careful consideration, it was decided that the line, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth, was not inspired. And this is exactly where we are. That which is beautiful and noble and true is now listed as not inspired. Whereas, to get what you can as quick as you can is now highly inspired. It is very noble. So here we go into further chaos. But I think it's nice to realize that watching the daily news and watching the motions of people and watching the new spirit arising among the nations of the earth, it looks like the old way is beginning to shine through again. The spirits are beginning to talk. The way it's spirit in the, in the Manado, in the Sachem's house on the top of the hill, is sending out more messengers. The time has come out of the sorrow and misery of materialism that a new idealism has to be born. And it is our privilege to come by, come by and live with it now. We can make the changes in our own lives that we want to see civilization make in the future. We can do all the things that we hope others will do, and we can start right now. And in doing that, perhaps the wise old ones in the mountains will come to us. The many Indians do believe firmly even now that the Great Spirit still lives. While they don't know just where it is and what it is and why it is, they know that somewhere in the great plan of things is infinite love, infinite good, and infinite beauty. That infinite patience is one of the virtues of God. And if we contribute as much as we can to these virtues in our personal lives, we will become more like God. And becoming like God will come to know God. These are the thoughts of the day, and I hope they will be of interest to you. <laughs>